Well, you all absolutely loved our first interview together. This Today, we are excited to have back Dr. Alicia Britt Choli. And if you know anything about her, if you heard our first interview or you've read her books, you know she is a sage. She is wise and she is bringing that wisdom to so many people that I know in real life that that call you mentor and friend. And so Alicia, thanks for being here. Oh, thank you so much. It's always a joy to interact with you. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. So let's talk about this. You you released a new book not yeah. too long ago. And and I mean, it's a word that that has a lot of feelings I feel like associated mm-hmm. with it. So disillusionment, yeah. talk a little bit about just this topic and and where this this came from. And the, the book is actually called The Night is Normal, which Oh, I mean, if somebody could have told me that the first dark night <laughs> of my soul, which I will say, you know, that is something we we mm-hmm. learn over time, but it mm-hmm. is it always, especially when you're young, it hits you so hard because you think life is supposed to go well yes. for those that love God, right? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Well, when we look back at the very, very, very beginning in the creation story, We see that night was one of the original residents of Eden. Mm. So before sin, before the fall, before the curse, night was there, Mm -hmm. which means that the night is normal, which means that from the very, very beginning, walking with God has required both day faith and night faith. Mm. And this concept just began captivating me actually several decades ago probably 30 years of study went before this book was printed. I was fascinated with the concept of spiritual pain. And I think night is a metaphor for that. Night is an image of those times in life where we spiritually ache, we spiritually hurt. Things are not spiritually the way that we thought they should be. And so I began to study Genesis to Revelation each and every one of those times where life was not at all, faith was not at all, God was not at all, what the people of God expected. And Mm -hmm. it was a fascinating study that captivated me for years and years and years. And so this book, The Night is Normal, is really the overflow of that study and honesty about real life. Have you walked through this season? Oh, my word, how many times? (laughs) How many times? Because you are such a woman of faith. So talk about what that looked like for you. Oh, there's been so many different types of nights for me. Um, One of my very first ones came about three or four years after Jesus interrupted my atheistic existence. And having been a sincere, adamant atheist, when Jesus revealed himself to me, it was, I mean, everything, Mm -hmm. everything became alive. The Everything went full color. And for those first few years, God's presence was so tangible. And every time I opened the word of God, it's like I heard his voice, the healing, I could touch it, I could feel it. The growth, it was measurable and visible to others. Mm -hmm. And I was in the middle of day faith. I was living out my belief in God in full sun, which is what we prefer We prefer to know clearly. We prefer to see clearly. We prefer to feel clearly. And then it was my senior year. So we're talking my fourth year of walking with Jesus. All of a sudden, the bottom seemed to fall out. And what I felt, I didn't feel anymore. What I was certain of, I was no longer certain of. For me, that very first night initiated by me trying to wrap my my mind around subjects that were really beyond me. I've always been a question asker, a truth seeker, but we have to let the Holy Spirit guide our thinking. And I had gone beyond those safe boundaries and was trying to understand things that I wasn't ready to. I felt like my faith had failed, that I was failing God. And it was a real moment of desperation where I thought I was about to lose what had saved me. Yeah. Well, I relate to that. I remember reading John of the Cross. Mm-hmm. And John of the Cross mm-hmm. when I was early twenties in a similar season. Yeah. And what he said was that dark night of the soul is, it's just exactly what you're talking about right now, that, that it is meant to mature us, that mm-hmm. it is meant where, where, when we stop hearing God's voice and feel like he's far away, there is a maturity that is happening in us where we are, which right. I've, I'll be honest, that comforted me at the time. 
But even to this day, because of course now the dark nights have gotten darker, right? Because problems yep. don't shrink in life. Um, the older you get, the more people you love and the more people um, that mm. can be going through difficulty around you and, and yes. therefore you going through difficulty. And so it doesn't feel like the nights have gotten any lighter yet. I I do feel more steady through them. So I, I assume the process has worked, but the fact that that's how the process goes makes me a little bit jaded, you know, mm-hmm. just because it, it does it all feel like some test or does it all feel like we are, um, he's just leading us along into suffering so mm-hmm. that we grow up. That just feels mean. <laughs> And I know, well, I know my feelings are, but I, I still struggle with this. Yes, well, absolutely. And that's honesty. What you just expressed is honesty. And I know I probably said this a hundred times already, just even in our conversations, honesty is a friend of nearness with God. Yeah. This is the place that the nights right. bring us yes. to. Yes. And so we are finite beings in relationship with an infinite being on our best day all of us together on our best days, we can't even comprehend a percentage of all that God is. That Mm. gap between our finiteness and his infiniteness is called sacred mystery. Wow. And so it's to be expected. And previous generations, previous centuries were more expectant of these types of nights. When our faith is growing, it's expanding beyond what we thought we knew and starting to encompass something that was previously beyond us. Mm. These kind of nights are a part of, they're a proven pathway of the maturation of faith. And when we're in the daytime, when our faith is in full sun and it's glittering and it's fantastic, the thing about being able to see clearly and feel clearly and know clearly is that we have a tendency to start Mm self-leading. We sort of tag with God and say, fantastic, thanks so much, I've got it. But in the night, right? Never. (laughs) In the night, we lose that kind of illusion because we can't see clearly and we don't know fully and we don't feel the same way. And so we have to decide who is it that we trust? Was it our understanding or is it his character? And that's where love grows. Love grows as trust grows and trust grows in the night. But it doesn't always feel like it does because I have a lot of friends that have been through so much. And there have been times that it feels like they might just walk away from Mm -hmm. God. And, and certainly some even have. And so let's talk about that disillusionment. I don't like that word because I do feel like I have experienced it. Of course we all have, I I hope and think all of us have, I think it's a part of, of growing and and trusting God more, but it also can feel like to other, when we're watching other people that they are like the dark got too dark. And yes. they, they walked away. Yes. Yes. Well, in the dark can get too dark. That's called despair. Right. So in disillusionment, what's actually happening, the word, if we were to break it down, it's the process of negating or leaving false ideas and ideals, the dissing of illusions. And there's an illustration that I use in the book, and I'm, I'm sitting here drawing a circle like everybody can see me who's hearing. But um, if we think about relationships, relationship with God, relationship with our own faith, relationship with other people of faith, they all seem to begin with a substance that I'll call joyful anticipation. It's the start. It's bright. It's often beautiful. It's filled with an expectation that this experience of good is a deposit on the belief that it will always feel this way. So we have this joyful anticipation that begins things. And then the next phase is disillusionment, where we start (laughs) losing some of the illusions that will always feel this great, and we have to make a choice. The problem is that we're in a culture that mistakenly calls joyful anticipation love, prematurely calls it love. And we mistakenly call disillusionment failure. And so when love fails, we bail. And this is a cycle we often find ourselves in spiritually. You know, if God loves me, then he will do this, not do this, allow this, never allow this, speak now, 
never be silent. And then our faith matures and we realize that God is far more complex, that his ways are beyond us, that if he led Jesus into the desert, he's going to lead us there too. But if we view the disillusionment as failure, we're very vulnerable to bailing. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I think this is one of the greatest snares that the enemy has set for us. And to be honest, as the leading generation, we've helped. Sure. We have helped. We have blur the lines between emotion and devotion. We have mistaken adrenaline for anointing. And we have set up a generation to have a very difficult time to distinguish between what is good and what feels good. Mm. So when they're lost in the night and they don't have a spiritual framework, they aren't saying, okay, wow, everybody's been here. Everybody who's ever had anything to say has been here. Job's been here. Elijah's been here. Moses has been here. John the Baptist has been there. Jesus has been here. This is normal. This means my faith is growing. My faith is advancing. My faith isn't retreating. If we don't have a biblical, historical framework for seeing the night as normal, we view the night as failure, and it's very, very easy to bail. Hmm. Well, and I I wonder if you know, the permission, I, I I think a lot about this, the permission to be frustrated with God, the permission mm-hmm. to shake our fist at God. You know, I, I, yes. I've sensed that, that when I teach on prayer, for instance, and I'm saying that that is prayer, mm-hmm. <laughs> shaking your fist at God is prayer. Young adults are looking at me like I am off and I am her heretic. And I'm like, hey, look at David. Like this isn't Thank hard you. to go prove. This isn't hard to go prove <laughs> biblically. Like this is this is very but for them, they mm-hmm. they didn't know that. And mm-hmm. I think so many Christians don't know yes. that that wrestling and anger. And I think what what often keeps me close to God in the night is the permission I feel to be yes. very forthright and angry and frustrated and beg him for things and question things he's doing. Mm-hmm. I I think that type of relationship is everywhere, but I don't know that everyone sees God that way or that they could yes. say those things. Yes. And I think that's a reflection of several different things, perhaps most of which that are beyond my comprehension. But I think that we have lost the example of the word. Mm-hmm. We we haven't stared at Jeremiah saying, you right. know, you're good, but I want to talk to you about your justice because that's just not making sense. And or, Jacob, like flat wrestling yeah, with him, right? Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Right. Or John the Baptist, you know, from the cool waters of the Jordan, he was like, there's the Lamb of God, follow him. But from the with all the walls of the prison, he sent word. He said, hey, are you the one I was waiting for? Or should I wait for someone else? He questioned the identity of Jesus. Mm-hmm. So we've lost the biblical stories that this is normal. This is a part of faith growing up. I think that we have lost that. And so we don't have this historical biblical framework to fall back on when we're in the middle of these spaces. We've got to reclaim them. We're talking a lot this season about grace and pressure. Mm -hmm. And I think this is right where this conversation is so helpful because I think the grace of struggle and the grace mm-hmm. of suffering and the grace yes. of of walking through that night is we don't give that enough. I, I think of my really dear friend that has walked through a difficult circumstance for six years now. And mm-hmm. it is it is so painful to watch. And I mean, I mean, I've watched it up close and she's gone through all different types of seasons with that suffering, right? Like there have been yes. times she can't get out of bed. And there's nothing to pray and nothing to say. There have been times that she is shaking her fist at God and angry and begging him for a change. There have been times where she feels joy and she's let go and she's just sitting in it. Mm -hmm. But as her friend wanting to turn the channel for her, like this, Mm -hmm. God, why won't you turn the channel? I think that's sometimes where it's almost like I can suffer for myself, but to watch someone I love suffer is almost even worse. Yeah. You know, it's like standing outside a burning house and you're going, I'd like to go rescue the person I love. Like, I don't want this to happen to them. Like, where are you, God? Why are you not rescuing? Talk a little bit about just that, like watching other people go through their night. Oh, 
that has been some of the deepest nights for me personally. Yeah. Is watching people walk through pain. It, the ingredients to everybody's night are not always known. Mine certainly haven't always been. There are ingredients sometimes beyond our sight. When we think about Job, I mean, his night began with a conversation in heavenly realms way beyond right. your shot. He didn't know that. Yeah. He didn't know. He didn't know. We look at Elijah. There was a ton Poor of Job. spiritual warfare there and exhaustion. We look at John the Baptist. Part of his night was his his commitment to justice and speaking the truth and where it landed him. And Jesus, his obedience. So I think that part of what helps me when my heart is just breaking, watching somebody else walk through the night is the recognition that I don't know all the ingredients and neither do they. Only God does. Yeah. Only God does. But the way to walk through the night remains the same, whether I think I understand it or not. And that's that commitment to follow. And we can rage while we're following. We can weep while we're following. We can rejoice while we're following. We can be a puddle of tears while we're following. The follow is what Jesus called us to from the very beginning. When you say that, I know you, Alicia, and mm -hmm. I've been around you enough to know that when you say that, that doesn't represent a pressure-filled way. Mm -hmm. But someone listening to those words right now, just that alone, like just you have to follow, mm -hmm. they might misinterpret that as pressure. Mm -hmm. Oh, talk, yeah. Talk a little yeah. bit about, about a different way to hear. That. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. I think that we can see follow as invitation. Mm. Invitation. So we're sitting in the dark. We can't see. We don't feel what we used to feel. And we're wondering if we failed or if there was some kind of turn we were supposed to make that we missed. And in the very beginning, when Jesus issued the calls to the disciples, it was all about relationship. Mm -hmm. If I could reframe follow, it would be, be with me. Yeah. Because I'm absolutely committed to being with you. Just mm -hmm. be with me. You don't have to perform. There isn't some kind of scorecard that you're aiming for. There isn't a checkbox uh, that I'm trying to evaluate you with. I simply want you. So it's a commitment from God of his presence, no matter how dark it is. And no matter and how it feels, whether he's exactly, there or not. Exactly. Because our senses don't create his presence. Yeah. That's good. If we feel absolutely nothing, it doesn't scare him off. Yeah. He's profoundly with us. So can we sit with God in the darkness and yell and weep? That is really all that's being asked. I'm tearing up thinking of a moment from The Chosen. Have you seen it? Oh, I'm only on like episode three of season two. So I'm working my way okay, through. Okay. Well, I don't want to ruin it for anyone, but it, it's, a, it's not going to. But Peter goes through something in the middle of season three that was really a night for him, a dark night. And Jesus seems to not care, it feels like, to mm -hmm. Peter. And... Mm -hmm. And it ends, the, the season ends with Peter breaking down to Jesus about it finally, because he hasn't been mad mm -hmm. yet. And it's just the sweetest moment because Jesus just holds him and yeah. they yes. cry together. And I, I feel like it was such a visual that I don't think we think about enough because in those dark moments, he feels so absent mm -hmm. and he's not fixing the problem, right? Like he could have fixed the problem. Yeah. We all know that he could. And yet... He is there with him. Mm -hmm. And I just, I believe that that is happening for so many people listening right now that yes. even if you don't feel him, even if you think he is so far away, he is, he's there, he's holding you and he yes. may not be fixing your problem today, but it, he promises that he will work all of these things together for good for those that love him. And so there will be a time, right? That these mm -hmm. nights will be made right. <laughs> that, yes. That we will yes. live in the sun. That's right. They won't last forever. But I keep remembering what he said to Thomas, blessed are those who believe but haven't seen. Right. And there is, there is a work that we are doing in our nights. Yeah. There is a placeholder of that Job had of this is 
awful. This makes no sense to me whatsoever. I'm not even sure I like you, but I believe in you. And where am I going to go? Right. That's right. Where am right. I going to go? But to you. And so yeah. there is there is a work. And I think that's part of the the problem in the night is that we feel so powerless and we feel so incredibly unproductive. Yeah. But there is a spiritual work being done when yeah. the times, I mean, I mentioned many, many nights, my word, uh, many, many nights. One of the more recent ones was watching my mother in incredible pain in the last few months of her life. Mm. And we were so close and losing her. I mean, I, I was just on the ground. I still can be. I just, mm. I miss her so much and why she, she died in such pain those last right. few weeks and those months. And so what could I do? Um, weep and wail and say, I believe you are here. And right. somehow we find ourselves eventually at uh, Occasionally, it's a short night. Some people, it's a long night. I've heard of people speaking of decades of night. Yeah, yeah. I've got those friends. Yeah. Yes. But what is happening in realms that we can't see, one day we're going to be able to look back. We really will. And we'll be able to realize that even what we thought was the mustard seed, what we thought was the tiny bit of faith that we could yeah. exercise, that it was doing wonders in realms beyond our view. We we're walking through Galatians in this season, and I think back to the beginning where Paul is saying, "Hey, don't complicate this gospel." Like, in fact, if it's a gospel that is complicated, it's in contrast to the true gospel. What would you say when you think of people walking around, even through dark nights, with heavy burdens? Mm -hmm. What would you say to them that feel like they're carrying? another gospel that they have to measure up and they have mm -hmm. to even suffer well and rightly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, one of my favorite statements is that God never wanted to use us. He always wanted to love us. And I think that in our Western church, we have measured maturity in terms of service, not in terms of love. And by love, I don't mean just loving God. I mean, knowing that we're loved by God. Yes. Yes, living yes, loved, yes. Yes. living loved. Because when we live loved, we live differently. When we live already loved, we lead differently. Right. And so I, with a heavy burden on us of maybe pain or grief or conflict or misunderstanding or being misrepresented, whatever the heavy burden might be of being betrayed, of being abandoned, whatever it might be, mm -hmm. my encouragement is always let us sit. Let us be silent. Let us consider the love of God mm -hmm. because his love for us is great. There's nothing we can do to add to it. There's nothing we can do to subtract from it. And his love isn't awaiting some kind of better moment where we feel great or some kind of pitch in a worship service or the perfect book that we stumbled upon. Uh, and I find, and it's counterintuitive, but I find that I understand my belovedness more when I sit in silence with my pain. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to outrun it, outgun it, stuff it, fluff it. I hurt. God, this just hurts. And it's that honesty that gives way. If I could tell a story, when I was little, my dad used to always sit me down. My dad was a closet atheist. I had no idea he was an atheist until after Jesus interrupted my life. But dad would sit me down and since I was tiny and he would say, what kind of questions do you have? What's the daughter thinking? And so from the age of two, my, until wow. my dad died, uh, I, I would just pour out all of these questions, my angst, my frustration, what I was worried about, what I was wondering about. And daddy and I would talk and talk and talk as I asked my questions into the wee hours of the morning, into adulthood. And when I look back, I don't remember one single answer we came to. Wow. I don't remember one problem that I had. A, oh, okay. Well, that's behind me. But I remember the safety of honesty. Yeah. I remember the safety of asking. And how that safety grew our relationship, it grew our trust. Wow. And so be honest, just yeah. be truthful, be honest. As sometimes I've seen children ask some fantastic questions and they receive sort of a shh, you don't, you don't say that about God. You don't, 
you don't right. ask that about God right. as though right. he's no. touchy or yeah. easily offended. Yeah. No, bring your questions with you. They will yes. enhance, not detract from your love for God.